Well, good morning and, uh, and welcome. Uh, my name is uh, Matt Wayne. I'm the pastor of Bethel Baptist Church in Clyde, and it's, it's amazing to be able to, to welcome you and to greet you from, uh, from the church building itself. It's been a long time. Um, and although, although we're only uh, recording, um, we pray that soon we'll be able to maybe meet in person here and, and enjoy fellowship again. But uh, it's a real um, source of, of joy to be able to, to welcome you from here. Um, we're going to be praying together and we're going to be reading from God's word from the Bible and uh, maybe some singing and the sermon. So um, let me start, shall we, as we turn to God in prayer. Let's pray. Almighty God, Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for all the good things that you do for us. And Father, we thank you for all the, the big blessings that you give us. Lord, we think of the, the greatest blessing of all, the, the risen Saviour, and all that the Lord Jesus means to us. And Lord, so we thank you for, thank you for taking care of the big things. For so Father, we thank you that you're interested in the small things too. For the, for, for the small blessings, perhaps, if that's a, a term that we can use. We thank you that we're able to, to be in church this morning and to, and to have the service from here. And Father, we pray that you will give much guidance and wisdom as we, we seek and research and, and look to maybe open up uh, on a Sunday once more for, for worship and fellowship. We thank you for your good gifts, Lord. And Father, as we, as we pray, we pray for one another. We pray for those who have been unwell, Lord, for those who are struggling. Pray, Lord, that you will lift them up. Lord, we pray for those who are maybe going through hard times emotionally, maybe, maybe spiritually. And Lord, we pray that you will be to them all that they need. Because, Father, we, we know we are confident that you are the God who hears our prayers. Lord, you tell us that in the Bible. So we pray, Lord, that you will hear our prayers. Thank you that you answer. Lord, pray that you'll give us much wisdom and patience uh, and understanding as we uh, move forward in a, in a way we pray that will be honouring and glorifying to you. We pray for all the village in which we are. We pray for Thly. We pray for our neighbours. We pray for, for the wider uh, North Wales area. And again, Father, we seek that you will be merciful to, to us, that you will, yes, draw men and women and boys and girls to come and bow the knee and acknowledge the Lord Jesus as Saviour and to come in repentance and faith and put their trust in him. Father, we, we thank you for the way that you've taken care of us as a fellowship over the last year, few months, over the last year even, and longer. And Lord, we, we thank you that we can be confident in your care for the future. So, Heavenly Father, we pray now that you'll, you'll be with us as we worship together. In Jesus' name, amen. If you've uh, uh, been with us for uh, a while, you'll, you'll know that we're, uh, we're looking at the Gospel of John together. And uh, we're towards the beginning of a, a Bible preaching series on, on John. And this morning we're going to continue our, our look into, uh, say, John chapter 3. I'm going to read some verses Probably not the verses maybe you would have been expecting, but I'm going to read from John chapter 3, and I'm going to read from verse 17 through to the end of verse 21. So, John chapter 3, verse 17. For God did not send his Son into the world to, to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the, into the world, and people loved the darkness rather than the light, because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light, and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. Amen. Let's continue, shall we, to, to worship God this morning as we sing our, our first hymn. Let's sing together, shall we? Jesus is Lord, the cry that echoes. Let's sing. Yeah. 
So as I mentioned at the beginning, um, I want to draw our attention, if you like, to the next verse um, in the passage. So um, John chapter 3 and verse 17, and it says this. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. And I want you to notice straight away, if you like, straight off the bat, that this verse starts with the word for. The word for. And you see, that's really important because that for, if you like, connects it back to the previous verse. So what John is saying is, based on verse 16, this is what I'm saying in verse 17. And in case you're wondering, you'll probably be aware that verse 16 starts with the word for. And again, you can only really read and understand verse 16 in the light of the previous verses that Jesus has been speaking. It's so important. So what has been happening? Well, over the last few weeks, we've, we've been considering chapter 3, as I said, and we've been, and I suppose unless we forget, we're looking at this, this meeting, this, this conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus. Remember, Nicodemus comes to Jesus at night. He's a Pharisee. He's a, a leader of the people. And he comes to, to Jesus and asks him questions. And Jesus really takes it as a, I say an opportunity, but he takes it as a, a teaching opportunity. He has this conversation with Nicodemus and he teaches him from the Bible. Now, as I was thinking about the sermon this morning in particular, I asked myself the question, and I'm going to ask you the question. I suppose if you're here, maybe you can put your hands up. But how many people know John 3, verse 16? And I suggest that if I was to ask that, you know, if I was to take 100 people off the street, probably most of them would be familiar with it. If they have anything to do with church or church circles, then almost certainly they would know John 3.16. I would probably go as far as to say that John 3.16 is the most, the best known verse in the Bible. And yet, I suggest that if I was to ask you, or those hundred people, whoever it may be, what the next verse was, well, maybe one or two, maybe a handful would know verse 17, but I think a lot less would be confident in quoting verse 17. And it's such a shame, isn't it? You see, verse 17 is, is one verse that we tend to overlook. Why? Well, because it's next to verse 16. I know that sounds crazy. Obviously, verse 17 is next to verse 16, but because of its proximity to verse 16, it tends to live in its shadow, so to speak. Just think about it for a minute. If, if verse 17 was placed anywhere else in the Bible, yeah, we'll go with anywhere else in the Bible. If it was placed anywhere else in the Bible, then I'm sure that it would be, it would be held in the same high esteem. It would be as much loved as verse 16, but it's not, is it? It's not, and it's next to the most famous verse in the Bible. But this is true. This is true in many aspects of life, isn't it? We all know of, of really, really good, maybe even great sportsmen who have not had the, the acclaim that they really deserve. Why? because they happen to be competing at the same time as a, an even greater sportsman, and, and they've taken the limelight. At any other time in history, they would be up there as a great, but because they're overshadowed, then they often get overlooked. Or, or think of mountains. We know, don't we, that the, the highest mountain in the world is Mount Everest, and in that mountain range, in the Himalayas, there are lots of amazing spectacular, spectacularly high mountains, probably most of which you and I have never heard of. Why? Well, they're just not as high as Mount Everest. 
How about the, the fifth highest mountain in the world, um, one called Makalu? It's 27,838 feet, just a little bit shorter than Mount Everest. But it hardly ever gets a look in. Why? Because it's in the Himalayas and it's overshadowed by Everest. Now, if you were to take that mountain, even though it's the fifth highest in the world and overlooked in the Himalayas, if you were to take that mountain and drop it into the middle of the Great Britain, just think of that for the minute, then do you know what? I'm sure everybody would know its name. Everybody would be talking about it. Everybody would be queuing to, to climb to the top. But it's overlooked because of Everest. And so I put it to you that the verse 17 is overlooked in the same sort of way. And yet you can't really understand John 3.16 unless you take it, understand it, read it in the light of verse 17. And as with all, all verses, all things in the Bible, context is the, is the most important. And here so even more. As we've thought, Jesus is, is talking with Nicodemus, this, this Pharisee, this, this leader of the people. Someone, someone who had studied the Bible, studied the Old Testament, studied the law. He knew it well. He knew it inside out. And, and yet, like just about everybody else in their day, he had a, a wrong view of the Messiah. What do I mean by that? Well, you see, it was thought that the Messiah would, would come and would release Israel. Just think about it. They were, they were under, um, say, under siege is the wrong word, but, but the Romans were there and they were held in bondage. They were slaves, if you like, to the Romans. They were, they were a defeated people. They lived as an, with an occupying force. And it was thought that the Messiah would come. So yes, these people were waiting for the Messiah. Nicodemus knew about the Messiah, was longing for the Messiah to come. Why? Because he thought, and the, the Pharisees thought, that the Messiah would come and he would conquer. He would conquer. He would, he would condemn the Romans. He would condemn the Gentiles. He would bring, if you like, judgment on them for what they'd done to Israel. And, and the Jewish people, the Jewish nation, would once again be exalted. That was their view. That's, that's what they were looking for. When the Messiah came, everything would be put right. And, and Israel would be top of the pile. And so Jesus here is, is having to teach him. He's having to say to Nicodemus, Nicodemus, you've got it all wrong. The Messiah, the Messiah is not coming to judge or to condemn, but to save. And that was Jesus' message, wasn't it? That's the message of John 3.16. And you know what? The Pharisees hated him for it. They hated him for it so much that they crucified him. Because it didn't fit in with their their understanding, their, their picture, their desire, their hope for the Messiah. And yet, actually, God might justly have sent Jesus for that purpose of judgment, to condemn. After all, we live in a, a sinful world, don't we, where, where we rightly deserve condemnation, we, we rightly deserve death. Oh, Jesus would have been well within his right to have come and to announce judgment. And yet God was willing to offer a pardon, to offer, to offer salvation, to offer a, a, way, a way out of the mess in which we'd got ourselves. And so that, that sentence of of condemnation, if you like, was delayed. But although Jesus did not come then to condemn, the Bible tells us that there is coming a time when he will return. And he will return in judgment. 
He will return to judge the living and the dead. But this wasn't that time. But you know what? Even having that message from Jesus to the Pharisees, it got even worse for the Pharisees. Not only was the Messiah not coming to condemn, not coming to, to rescue them, he was coming to save. Not just this, but, but to save who? Whoever believes in him. That's John 3.16, isn't it? For God so loved the world that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Who, who, whoever. That means, that means that invitation of salvation is open to all. It's open to Jew. It's open to Gentile. Oh, that was truly shocking for the Israelites, for Jews. That God should save Gentiles? Oh, no. Oh, no. If Jesus didn't come into the world to, to condemn the world, why then? Why, why do we need saving at all? Why did he not come to condemn us? Well, the truth of the matter is that we're already condemned. We don't actually need anyone to, to come and to tell us. We're already living in condemnation. The, spy, the Bible speaks so much about condemnation. Why? Because, because sin has permeated through mankind. Listen to what the, the prophet Isaiah says in Isaiah 59 verse 2. Your iniquities have made a separation between you and God. And your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. The Bible tells us that, that right from the beginning, right from the, the book of Genesis, right from when Adam and Eve were here, sin and condemnation entered the world. How do we know? Physically, because we all die. We all die, don't we? Um, what's the saying? There are only two things that are certain in life. One is death, and the other is taxes. But we know about death, don't we? We know, we, know we, we understand that we all die. But that's, that's not how we were created. We weren't created for death. We were created for life, to live forever with God. But because of Adam's sin and therefore our sin, we live under condemnation. The punishment for that sin is what? Well, it's death. Sin brought forth death. And we have no escape. No way out. But it's not just physical death that we will endure one day. The Bible says that we are, we are living with spiritual death. We, we no longer enjoy that, that close relationship with God. You know that relationship as we read it in Genesis that, that Adam enjoyed with God, where they would, they would talk together and enjoy such closeness together before Adam fell. Paul, Paul writes about it much. Read, a, read Romans, read, read Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1 where Paul says, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins. Paul says, this is the state of man. We are dead. Oh, we may be walking around. We may be literally dead men walking. But we're spiritually dead. We're separated from, from the holy God because of our sinfulness. And we are all guilty. No one is innocent. And as humans, aren't we, we, we really are in a mess of our own making, with no way out by ourselves. Hopeless. You may not like what I'm saying, you might not even believe what I'm saying, but when you, when you really search your heart, 
You know there are things there that maybe ashame you, embarrass you, thoughts that you wouldn't want anyone else to know, things maybe that you've done that were they to come to light. Oh, the shame, the embarrassment, prison maybe. So we know, we know that we're in a mess. And, and that actually, that's the real beauty of verse 17. Why? Because verse 17 tells us that Jesus came in order that the world might be saved through him. Not condemned, saved through him. No, no longer living under condemnation for those who have put their faith and their trust in the Lord Jesus. Sins forgiven. No guilt. No guilt for the wrong that you've done. No shame anymore for the wrong that you committed. No, no longer separated from God. Not just no longer separated. Now, the Bible says we've been adopted into his family. Now we are where we belong. We're able to call God our, our heavenly father. He is our loving heavenly father, the Bible says. What a blessing that is. That's, that's why Jesus left heaven. That's why he took on human form. That's why we celebrate Christmas. So the son of God taking on human form. Why? To save us. To rescue us. Only a man could save us. Just think about it for a minute. Only a man could save us. If it was possible for a, an angel to save us, then I'm sure God would have sent an angel, maybe Gabriel or Michael or one of the archangels, if it was possible. But it wasn't. The only way that you and I can be right with God was if a man, someone like us, but not like us, paid the penalty for our sin. None other than the Holy One, the Son of Man, the very Son of God Himself. It was out of love, not cruelty, that God sent His only begotten Son into the world to die for the sins that I've committed and you've committed. And then, and then the simple truth, but the so important, powerful truth is that through him we can be saved immediately. No longer under condemnation. We sang the hymn last week, and can it be? No condemnation is that line of one of the verses. No condemnation. And that is, that's the greatest news. It's been in the, in the UK news this week. Um, I think it was uh, some post office uh, employees have been accused of, of fraudulent matters because a system, a computer system was wrong and they, they'd lived with the, with the thought of being criminal. Some of them had been in prison and yet it was proved that they were innocent. And, and you saw the, the relief and the joy. Well, friends, just multiply that a million fold. But we have been guilty. We are wrong in God's sight. But because of the Lord Jesus, oh, we can know forgiveness. We can know our sins removed. That was Jesus' message to Nicodemus that night. And that's Jesus' message to, to you and to me today. Jesus came to save the lost. Came to save the condemned. Came to save you and me. And that is, that's great news. That's the best news. That's the best news you and I will ever hear. Will ever know. 
But friends, be warned. Be warned. You see, the Bible tells us, as we thought earlier, that, that Jesus is coming again. But this time it won't be to, to save. He'll come as judge. And it'll be too late. So I leave you with, with three questions this morning. Question one. Are you ready to meet the Lord? Are you ready? If Jesus was to come back today, would you be ready to give an account for yourselves? Would you be able to, to bow the knee as him as Lord and Saviour? Or would you argue? Have you turned from your sin? And have you turned towards the Lord Jesus in repentance and faith? And then secondly, if you are a Christian, thanks be to God for that, but are you, are you looking forward to the Lord's return? Even if you're, you're ready to meet him, we need to live, don't we, with, with expectancy. We need to, to think maybe, maybe, maybe today is the day. Maybe he will come back for me today. Are you expecting him to return? Are you living in that sort of expectancy? And then my third question to leave you with. If you really, if you really believe that this is true, if you really believe Jesus is returning, just as he said, if you really believe that Jesus has saved you by dying on a cross, who are you going to tell about it? Who are you going to share it with? This, this is great news. Um, over the last few weeks, maybe, maybe a couple of months, um, I suppose one of the top, uh, top lines of conversation is, have you had the vaccination? Have you had your jab? First jab, second jab, which one? It's all we seem to talk about. Why? Because it's so important. Well, I put it to you that this is even more important. This, this is the gospel. This is the news, the good news that Jesus died for our sins. And he rose and then he ascended to heaven where, he, where he's preparing a place for us. And that one day soon he will return and take us to be with him. Is this what you believe? Is this what, what gets you excited and thrilled when you, you think about these things? If it is, then, then when, why don't you try and tell one person this week about Jesus? Just one. Don't, don't try knocking on the doors in your street and trying to try and tell 50. Just start with one. Just share the good news with that one person. And remember, before you talk to your friends about God, Talk to God about your friends. Pray for them. Pray that God will, through his Holy Spirit, open their eyes to see the truth of the things that we've been talking about this morning. Amen. Let's, let's sing, shall we, as we, we come to the close of our service this morning. We're going to sing, All I Once Held Dear.
As we close, let me pray. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. So the only God, our Saviour, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. So what are you going to do? What are you going to do with Jesus? We'd love to hear from you. Um, please, if you can, get in touch either through the, the comments section on the bottom of the YouTube video or through Facebook or Instagram. Um, there's a contacts page on our website, BethelBaptistLive.co.uk. It'd be great to hear from you. But we pray that God will bless you this week and that you'll know his presence with you. Take care. God bless. Bye-bye.